So I'd like to to think I was on the path, like uh, the millionaire next door, or random walk down Wall Street to to arriving there one day. It was kind of accelerated, uh, kind of a couple of days before Christmas in 2012. My dad woke up, turned around, and grabbed his chest, and apparently fell over, and that was it. So the next day, my brother and I were running his uh, his medical practice, but just overnight, really, it was living our lives to dad passing away. Then all of a sudden, like uh, as the months went by and we started doing some forensic accounting, if you will, by hunting down tax returns because nothing was written down. We luckily he never threw anything away either. So we had 30, 40 bankers boxes worth of documents to hunt through. You're listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast, where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their current portfolio allocation. Now to your hosts, Clark Sheffield and Jace Mattinson. Welcome back to another episode of the Millionaires and Veil Podcast. This is episode number 169. Clark, how's it going? What's going on in your world? Good. How are you doing? Anything doing new? doing great. No, nah, man, just plugging away. You know, we had a crazy snowstorm here this last weekend uh, in Austin, man. It was nuts. <laughs> I'm building the snow, man. Like six inches of snow in my yard. It's like you know, I grew up in, in uh, Washington. I remember that was kind of the norm in the winter. But moving to Austin, we hadn't seen snow. I think before we moved here, it, people in the city had told us they hadn't seen snow in a decade. In the last five years, I think we've had snow like three times. I didn't realize it's kind of it was nuts. six inches. Yeah, my house is crazy. Got tons. So you couldn't go biking. No, I mean it, it. It didn't stay for too long. I think it, it. Well, it's mostly all melted by now. But yeah, I mean, it was Sunday was absolutely insane. But <laughs> that's pretty good. That's more than we've had almost. Well, probably not, but it seems like it. Yeah, it's been kind of a. It seems like a mild winter, but I tell you what, I man. Two days before that, I was out golfing. And, you know, like shorts and t-shirt weather. And by the end of this week, I'm probably gonna be back on the lake. So you know, it's just one of those deals. It's just kind of a weird, crazy storm and dump some snow in Central Texas, which is. It's pretty rare. Yeah. So speaking about Texas, we had an interview tonight with a guy from Texas, and he talked about he works for a big company in Texas and talked about their new work from home policy, which is indefinitely. Yeah. You can work five days a week from home, and it seems like that's where a lot, well, not a lot, but you're hearing it more often, right? A lot of companies are heading that way. Yeah, it's. I think it's a very interesting shift on a on a macro and a micro level amongst you know corporate America and just companies in general and even across the globe and what effect that might have on real estate and investments, company performance for the future, and you know do people think about where they live and how they live drastically differently than they have in the past. You know, there's uh, an article that came out about, I think it was a Siemens CEO. You know, they, they announced somewhere they got uh, several hundred thousand employees around the globe, massive, massive company. And, uh, you know, he made this this comment. So the basis for this forward looking working model is for is further development of our corporate culture. These changes will also be associated with a different leadership style, one that focuses on outcomes rather than on time spent at the office. We trust our employees and empower them to shape their work themselves so that they can achieve the best pop- possible results. With the new way of working, we're motivating our employees while improving the company's performance capabilities and sharpening Siemens' profile as a flexible and attractive employer. So, Clark, you and I both have, have worked in environments where being at the office or, or at least plugged in at the office, one of those kind of unwritten rules that you always were there. And it was amount of hours at the office in a way more than, you know, results in a lot of ways. And here we have, you know, CEO of a major, major company, the massive paradigm shift saying that they're, they're going to be looking at outcomes rather than time spent. Which is just going to trickle down across multiple companies, you know, and, and industries. And this will be something that I think companies use as a tool for recruitment. What are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, it's interesting. When I think like, okay, if, if you got the choice, do you want to work from home five days a week? Do you want to work in the office five days a week? Do you want some happy medium in between? I'm not sure. I, t- I, I don't think I'd take five in the office and I don't think I'd take five at home, candidly. I think I, I think I would take a little bit of both, maybe three at home and two in the office. I kind of like working in the office occasionally. I mean, I've done it every day for years, but I still think that's beneficial to be in person. I like in person rather than Zoom, especially if you have multiple people. I mean, it's so annoying when you have six people on a Zoom call and you're all trying to talk. You don't know who's talking. So I think things get left unsaid. Body language is hard. 
So I think some combination would be my my pick. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I, I really do value FaceTime. Uh, you know, how much FaceTime and, and, and what kind of quality FaceTime, you know, makes sense or not. I think just a lot of conversations that happen face to face and call a water cooler talk or whatever that, that maybe you wouldn't have if you're not working in an environment where you, where you do and, and just some of the creativity that comes out of working near somebody too. But I'm with you. I think, I think this hybrid model, uh, is here to stay. And I think a lot of people, especially in our generation, somewhat prefer it to maybe work in a more flexible environment and, and I don't know that it's necessarily always working at home, but just maybe working, you know, we'll, I'll be interested to see if there's some of these like micro pods like pop up. You know, we had WeWork that, that went on a tear there for a while and redesigning office space for smaller companies. But I wonder if there will be something like that as well for companies that maybe get into these big cities and they create, you know, someone like a hub and spoke where they say, hey, look, we'll lease a little chunk of space in this you know, neighborhood and this suburb and set up office space where people can go and plug in there, you know, or meet there in that location yeah. if their team lives in that area versus everybody centralizing and commuting into the big city where it's an hour commute or 35 minute commute or whatever it might be for some of those people. Cause I think that's what a lot of the gripe was coming to the office, right? It's like having to deal with the commute. Yeah. And that probably means then for a company that office space becomes cheaper too. Because it doesn't have to be as sexy. Totally. It doesn't have to be in good of, as good of a location. It doesn't have to be under one umbrella. I mean, maybe it gets more complicated because then you have all this IT system stuff going on. But probably not. If you can work from home, why can't you work from a little random office? So, yeah, I like the flexibility. And I think it's cool that companies are taking that route. I think we've been so reluctant to allow for those changes, even if it's like paid time off. You know, more vacation time, more time off if you have a kid, paternity or maternity leave. So I think it's nice to see companies showing a little bit more flexibility. I think overall corporate greed and is hurting us in, in the long term. Yeah, totally. Be interesting to see and, and how it plays out. On today's show, we have Kevin. He has a net worth of $1.4 million and works in cybersecurity. He rebalances his portfolio once or twice a year, which is pretty unique for, for our millionaires. And he does not worry about paying the tax bill when he does that. He has about 500000 in a taxable account, another two fifty in a 401k, and he's got quite a bit in his home equity and, and some in a cabin. He started out making $8 an hour and tells his story about how he's grown his career. One unique thing about Kevin and his story is, you know, one day he was going about his life, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners and, and people in society experience this, uh, and the next day, is, is sadly, his father passed away. And so we get into how that all came about. He and, his, he and his brother found themselves running the medical practice that his dad had the next day and trying to keep all the employees, you know, on payroll and everything and trying to get the business sold and Really, really crazy story, but definitely one that I believe resonates uh, with with a lot of our listeners and, and a lot of people who experience whether it's loss and you know discovering unknown assets or, or what have you. And uh, you know, Kevin's dad did a really good job in, in keeping all these documents, and so they were able to to discover a lot of these things. And we get into all that detail about how he's been able to kind of roll that into his life and his brother's life and to continue to leave a legacy, uh, you know, that his father left behind them as it relates to living a frugal life and, and you know, continuing to generate wealth for them and their family. Last week we had David. He currently works as a police officer after spending eight years in the Marine Corps. After the Marines, he went into corporate America and then became a police officer and started investing in real estate. He also invests in gold and silver and does not really trust the market uh, investments, but still does have about 300k in the market. So, very fun interview with David. His net worth was 2.1 million. If you're interested in, in that episode, super interesting. Definitely one of our uh, millionaires has a little bit more in precious metals than than most. We appreciate you turning into the, the podcast week after week. If you enjoy the show, we'd appreciate leaving a five star review and either iTunes or Stitcher. Help us grow the show and continue to reach new millionaire interviewees. If you're interested in being on the show as a millionaire interviewer, you want to be nearly there, please send us an email. Uh, once again, our, G our email is millionairesunveiled at gmail.com. Also, we have several multifamily and commercial uh, investment opportunities for accredited investors at this, at this time. If you're interested, please reach out. We'll jump on a call and, and go walk through our process with you. So without any further delay, let's get into the show with Kevin. Kevin, do you want to just give us a little bit about your background and what you're up to now? I guess for the most part, I've always been a, a 
a nerd slash engineer. I got into computers by accident by turning off and on a printer in fifth grade and kind of what I've been doing ever since and started at eight bucks an hour and now make a little over 60. So give or take. Wow. And what is your net worth today? Depending on the stock market or property values, somewhere around 1.2 to 1.4. It's all fluid, of course. Like most of it's in a, uh, it's cost basis adjusted. So it's already, I paid taxes on most of it already. And I try to every year or so raise that because the bulk of my net worth is in uh, taxable accounts, not retirement accounts. Totally. And you've got a, a pretty re- unique story that we'll get into in a second. But how is that 1.2 to 1.4 invested? <laughs> Primarily in like DTI or VOO type funds, I do kind of sell in and sell out sporadically, like once or twice a year. Well, some of that is just to raise the cost basis. Uh, I know some people are probably biting their torches and pitchforks for me paying taxes, but I like the flexibility of being able to pivot if I see something I want to change. And if I'm afraid to pay taxes, I'll never be able to do that. So f- mostly at 500 in a taxable account, I got 225, 250 ish in the 401k. 30-ish in a Roth. Primary house is worth maybe 500. I've only got like 200 left to pay on that. Got a cabin. I own half of my brother. A piece of land that I'm actually sitting on right now doing this podcast with you gentlemen. And just some other odds and ends that could be worth maybe 100K, give or take. Awesome. And and before we get into how you've gotten to where you are now, I, I want to back up. You said you have 200 and some thousand in your 401k and you're in cybersecurity, right? How correct? How did you accumulate that over? I mean, you're you're relatively young for our listeners. How did you accumulate that so quickly? Well, so my dad is very frugal, so I was just very used to that environment. It was just saving first and saving a lot, and then just spending the rest and living on the rest. So even when I was making eight dollars an hour, I was in the habit of saving fifty, twenty five dollars a paycheck, and then just letting it slowly build. So I carried that over once I started making. Uh, more higher wages. So I'd start out by, I don't know, 8% of nothing is still nothing, but it kept compounding over time. And every raise I got, I just added that to increase my contributions. So eventually I max the 401k and the Roth, and I probably save an additional five to 800 a month. And I plunk that into the taxable. So that's every single month I've been able to do that for the past seven years or so. And did you start investing in the 401k before when you were making eight bucks an hour and stuff back then? Or is this more recent that you've been able to accumulate that? I did start back then. But of course, uh, in your early 20s, you're not the brightest period of your life. So I was like, I switched jobs and I was like, oh, there's 3000 sitting there. I'll just cash that out and didn't realize you got penalized, but blew that money on who knows what. It was a long time ago now. So I started over probably two years after that. I was making about 13 bucks an hour and had a 401k at the company. So I just put in as much as I could at the time and kept growing it. Well, it's pretty remarkable that you pivoted so so young and early, even though you grew up in a frugal household, that you were able to recognize those mistakes you know, somewhat early and, and pivot and it put you on a different direction. So just to give our listeners some context, how have you arrived at millionaire status? I know you wrote into us and you've got a very unique story and, and one that I think will provide a lot of value to our listeners. But do you want to just give some context around that to, to our listeners and, and, and how you have arrived to where you are today? Sure. Um, so I'd like to, to think I was on the path like uh, the millionaire next door or random walk down Wall Street to, to arriving there one day. It was kind of accelerated uh, kind of a couple of days before Christmas in 2012. My dad woke up, turned around and grabbed his chest and apparently fell over. And that was it. So the next day, my brother and I were running his, uh, his medical practice with uh, three employees and their families that were running. So we, so my brother had just luckily just graduated college. So he moved into my dad's house, started taking care of the horses, all, all the other ancillary stuff associated with that. Gosh, I'm getting a little, a little flustered. Uh, so we were taking care of the people and the families. We started trying to sell the business and we eventually did. But just overnight, really, it was living our lives to dad passing away. Then all of a sudden, like uh, as the months went by and we started doing some forensic accounting, if you will, by hunting down tax returns because nothing was written down. We Luckily, he never threw anything away either. So we had 30, 40 bankers boxes worth of documents to hunt through. So we just started calling all these people or all the investment accounts, et cetera. And uh, eventually, in the end, we both ended up with, I don't know, five, 600 in cash each and then uh, properties and other random odds and ends. 
to get to the most of the number that I have today. Yeah, so that's more or less the story is just kind of overnight and lots of pain and hunting and reading and just dealing with probate. So I think it's probably the biggest thing I could urge listeners, anybody young or older, is write everything down. Don't be afraid to have those conversations with your parents or your children in this case. Like there's nothing worse than not knowing where things are, but that having recollections of these things, it just turns into a witch hunt that you drives you mad after a little while. And uh yeah, have the conversations. Yeah, totally. I, I can only imagine what that's like. So I mean, just to give our, our listeners who may have not experienced that, have you had any of those conversations with, with your father beforehand? Or was this just, you're thrown into the fire, go figure it out. You kind of know where some of the things are. You know, you know, roughly what's going on in his in his financial life and business life. Uh, with zero conversations, nothing. It, it was just one day it's cool, the next day it's different. You know, like life had changed like literally overnight, like that quickly. And uh, yeah, so there's, there was nothing like trying to think of how did we find certain parts? Like we were just cold calling people for a while. Oh, um, there was a, a credit union that we found a statement with his name on it for a decent amount of money. And we went to the bank and they pulled it up like, oh, there's nothing here. We're like, hey, wait a second. We have the statement like th- this. It's just legitimate. Like we have the statement in our hands. The lady looked it up. She said, hang on. And the manager comes out and goes, we had the social fat fingered by one digit. So if we didn't press with that uh, statement in our hands, we would have missed out on $100,000. And we wouldn't have known about it for who knows how long. It's like, oh, man, unclaimed property. That's one of the many of the similar type of things like that. that for whatever reason, you just had accounts all over the darn place. Well, I mean, Kevin, first of all, I appreciate you sharing. You know, it's, it's obviously it. not, not easy to do. So I appreciate you sharing and opening up and allowing us and, and listeners and anybody who's listening to learn from it. So thank you, first and My foremost. My pleasure. How did you know where to start? Was it just going through those boxes? I, I don't know if he was married. Did your mom know? or so How I'm, did you know where to start? Uh, my parents had divorced uh, 10 years prior. So my mom didn't really have any idea because being a businessman, he kept uh, all his documents and records fairly separate, as you should, owning running a business, you know? So the, we started mainly by every piece of mail that came to the office. We'd go through it together and we had this uh, flow chart or it's like Microsoft project, like a task list. And we'd write down every new statement that came in. If we'd run it to ground, if we hadn't run it to ground, if what was there, what was not there, was it closed 10 years ago? Cause we probably called 20 places that it would had already been closed and then tax returns. Like there's no hiding from the IRS. So the tax returns were like the saving grace. And luckily he had kept everything. So that was the only place that we got everything was tax returns. And he had all the supporting documentation as well, right? Because it won't necessarily always tell you, hey, he's got $100,000 in a Vanguard account or wherever, right? But Correct. He had the supporting doc that was maybe a 1099 dividend. Correct. Able to help track it down. So we would have that. We'd have the tax return. And then we would be able to hone in where we needed to go. It took a long time. We had to go to the county and order like 15 uh, what is it, uh, death certificates. Because most of these companies, they want proof of the, the deceased. So we would have to mail in signed notarized documentation from the two of us with the notary and the death certificate for them to release funds to us because the beneficiaries had not been set. But we were the only two heirs. So it was, that was actually pretty simple. But it was a really huge pain in the butt because if the beneficiary had been set, all we'd have to do is prove our own identity and they then cut a check and it was piece of cake. So it took five times longer than any other person would have had to go through in that scenario. So were you still work? You, you said your brother just graduated college. Were you still working at the time? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I had been working full time since I was 18, just on my own. And luckily, my brother graduated. He moved in with me just for a couple of months to kind of just hang out and see what he wanted to do. And then that was what he was going to do. He was going to run the business and move into my dad's house like literally the next day the, after he passed away because he had to. So w- without my brother, this would have been like much more of a, a crapshoot. Right, because you're, you're trying to handle it while you're working full time. Yeah, and I was a single dad with a, a four-year-old or a three-year-old, two-year-old at the time. So it was a little tough. What did you end up doing with the house? Did you guys sell it? Did you guys still own it, rent it out, or what did you do? Uh, we were going to keep it, and I basically got remodeled it. And I would probably still be living there today, but you know, life 
and God has other plans for you sometimes. So I ended up moving up here and then we sold it and just split the proceeds from that. Uh, it was pretty easy to sell. I mean, California being California. And, and you mentioned your, your father had a medical practice, right? I don't know if he was a doctor. Or, or Correct. He was a doctor. Med- so was that, how'd you do that? You had to transfer clients. I mean, you obviously probably had appointments or. Yeah. So we. That in and of itself is a big task. That was scary. I had never been so afraid because there was actually people that had counted on me besides myself, like families that we needed to provide and get food for. So we once we figured out where his business bank accounts were, we went and talked to the bank manager and the lady knew him very well. The manager did. And by the grace of God, my mom's name was still on as a signatory on that account. So she was able to add us as signatories so we could take full control of his business account, like pretty much instantly, which allowed us to pay the bills for the business, pay salaries, most importantly, because it happened over Christmas, the girls were just getting ready to go on vacation. So my brother and I felt very strongly that to let them know that everything was fine, that their paychecks are safe. There's enough money to keep the business afloat. There's enough accounts receivable to cover for a while. So we gave them a, a bonus like, hey, we're here with you. We're in this together. It's like, I don't know what the future holds and we're going to try to sell it in continuity for you guys, which we were able to do. We found uh, another doctor who wanted to move and bought the practice. So they lost zero paychecks and zero time. So that was like priority one for me was just taking care of them and Sean uh, too. Was your brother going to help run the medical practice or just to, to help figure things out before he started working full time doing something else? So he was just kind of there kind of running things. I mean, Granted, the office manager does 98% of the work. He was just kind of just hanging out. We were we were hunting and looking for things. So he was just mostly hunting for stuff to close accounts and try to find a buyer for the business as quickly as we could. And how quickly were you able to sell it? Probably it took about a year, give or take, about that long. Pretty it good. Just took, yeah, it good. takes a while to find a doctor that wants to buy it from you and move to the town you live in, of course. But luckily, it was a solid practice with a lot of history, so it sold pretty easily. I was very fortunate. And and did the person who bought it, did they combine practices with another one, or was that, did they just buy it outright and that was their first practice? Uh, I believe it was their first. They were pretty new at a med school, so they just bought it whole kit and caboodle, and off they went. So as far as I know, it's still booking along it's been years since i've been back there so i couldn't tell you now but as far as i know it's good so I, i'm curious kevin you mentioned this and i i don't have any experience in it and so i don't know personally but wh- when you find a statement like that right you mentioned the hundred thousand i mean let's just yeah. use that for, for an example right you just call them up and and you say hey my you know my dad's the owner of this account he passed away like walk us through that process how does that all work well for the, the bank account with the one off digit for the social, uh, luckily for us, a lot of these institutions had offices in our town and he had been a business person in the town. So a lot of people knew him. He was outgoing, did, he was active. So a lot of people knew his name, which is very helpful. I am much more comfortable speaking to people in person because I'm, I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm just good at report, building rapport with people pretty quickly. So I, I would just go to these places and, Asked to speak to the manager, or set up an appointment with the manager. Like, hey, here's my situation. You probably know my dad. He passed away, etc. And uh, we just hammer it out. And if there was something we needed to do next for next step, they would walk us through it. If not, or like they would tell us, oh, that account is closed X years ago, <laughs> or here's the sucker on your way out the door. I mean, everybody was really friendly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just I would go and physically speak to them. Because it's a lot easier when you're in front of somebody with the paperwork than over the phone trying to explain something that the lady or the person on the phone has no idea what it says or doesn't say. Yeah. How were you able to, were there some like that where they didn't have an office in the town that you just had to? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So that I would call because I like to speak to people or and uh, give them all the account information. But they would always want uh, signed, notarized documents that you are who you are with a certificate of death mailed to them so they could review it personally. There's another thing I noticed that's even stronger than uh, maybe stronger than notary it might be the wrong terminology, but they call it a medallion signature. Um, it's something that only a bank can give you. And very few people seem to know about this. So, for instance, like one of the major investment accounts. Uh, brokers, they asked us for a quote medallion signature to release the funds to us after we had pro- proved our identity and sent in the paperwork. So my brother and I, like, what the heck is this? So we hunt around, eventually go to our uh, credit union, 
And the lady says, yes, I can provide a medallion. My medallion is only signable up to 250000 or some number like that because she can guarantee up to that amount. And so a lot of the bank managers don't like using it because I think it puts them liable. I, I'm not 100% sure on that, but they were very reluctant to give us the quote medallion signature or stamp. But we eventually got that taken care of, sent it to the brokerage house, and then they released the funds and gave us a check. Wow. How long did all this take? Well, since there was no will or trust, we got stuck in probate. And we flew through probate. And I I say that very jokingly because it was still three years before we got the final probate paperwork done. So what, 2013? So it was middle of 2016 before it was complete. And that's just the probate piece. Like there was still property in probate like the house and some uh, cabin and stuff like that. The investment accounts... They, there's something called a TOD or POD, so transfer on death or payable on death. As the they call that the poor man's trust, where if you assign your account to TOD beneficiary, if you pass away, they just write a check to that person and it's done. So there was a there was stuff that was TOD and then there was stuff in probate. So we got stuck in the middle a little bit. That's the thing. Like, don't get stuck in probate. Like, if anything, like talk to your parents, have the conversation, make sure. You have an idea of where to start. Like probate is the worst. And then it's also public record after that. Like, I don't know how many people want all their parents' lives or what they're going to inherit posted on every county website. Fairly private person, but anybody can go look that up now if they know what to look for because it's there forever. It's public record. I would say you have a trust, definitely have a trust and do the TUD beneficiaries is like number one. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. So thank you. I appreciate you sharing that. How many different accounts or properties, let's say, right? You mentioned the cabin, you mentioned the house. How many different things like that were, was there money or assets in? Ten? Physical properties, let's say one, two, three, three and a half, four, something like that. And um, is then monetary or financial properties or assets. I want to say close to 20. Like it wow. was just like You're if 25, you have 25 different things you, had, you guys had to track down. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It, it was just little sprinkles all over the wrong place. I don't, I don't know what he was thinking, but reading back through time, you can see like the evolution of him going through this broker, then buying extremely high load, high expense ratio of funds. And then he would move to a different one. They'd get a little bit better. And then the next one to get a little bit better. It eventually ended up at one of the big brokers that he would just purchase his own funds and he wouldn't have to pay all the loads and commissions. It was, it was kind of interesting. Like once I started nerding out all through 2013 about investing, I could see the evolution of what he was doing, but he never cleaned up after himself. I'm sure listening dad that curse you for not cleaning up because it was a pain in the butt. <laughs> so did you have conversations at all before? Or did, I mean, I asked you earlier, where did you start? But did you know, Hey, I, you know, obviously you know, the house, you knew of the cabin. Did you, was there other things that you knew with certainty you had to start or was it all just figure it out? For the most part, it was just figure it out. There's this, like, you might laugh at this story a little bit, but I learned there's this whole world of coin collectors and it's called the numismatist. Uh, so my dad liked to collect coins, silver, gold bullion, like Krugerrands and stuff like that. We knew we had a coin collection, but we did not know was the extent of this coin collection. So we would open the closet that was always locked and we never questioned it because we were adults and we don't need to go digging. So we find the key, open the closet, and there's like these plastic bins full of bags that look kind of like the 1950s bank and robber bags, you know? And we'd open them up and there'd be just pounds and pounds of uh, silver dimes or silver quarters. So he loved to collect the stuff he bought when we were born, just bags of, uh, I don't remember the names of the coins now, but they're 90% silver and they're like they're worth like a dollar or something each and where the face value is only 10 cents, right? So we had sold enough of these coins to the coin shop. So they're like, we can't buy anymore because you bought us out of all of our cash. Like, we're like, oh, I still got like 20 pounds of dimes. Like, are you sure you don't want any more? <laughs> it, it was just silly little things like that. It was a forced yeah. crash course in the world that I've never even dreamed of. Like, right. You got to go I'd, figure it out. Yeah. How Luckily, much was uh, the coin collection all worth? How, how much did you get for all that? Did you keep any of it? So I sold most of the junk. They call it junk silver and lingo. Apparently, I sold all of that for it was like forty thousand. Like we're talking a, a lot of money. Like I did it slowly over time, and it took a long time because finding buyers for that is difficult sometimes. So then you we took still, it to coin collections. You posted it on eBay or both. 
I would go to coin stores and then sell it. And I built a really good relationship with the local guy, but eventually he couldn't buy any more. So I would have to go out of town and sell them too and take a little bit of a bigger haircut. You know, was, it, yeah. No, it's good. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. It's so interesting. Oh, it's so interesting because there's so much that we're not mentioning that I can just imagine went on here, right? There, there had to have been a bunch of back and forth with you and your brother, right? What should we do? What should we keep? Should we keep some? Should we sell some? What should we do with the property? What should we do with the horses, right? Yeah. I mean, there's got to have been, and, and maybe you don't want to admit it, but there's probably some arguments there, right, of trying to deal with it or maybe not. I don't know. And then also you're probably questioning yourself this whole time of did we find everything? So that still haunts my brother today because he has this vivid memory of seeing uh, some, like a, a box of something. And I, I, I don't have any memory of it, but it, he still brings it up and he swears it's somewhere. So he doesn't have any clue. So I know it bugs him quite a bit. I've kind of like let that go. Like I'm more than happy with everything that I've been blessed with receiving. And A box if, of something, meaning there was something inside of it and that was valuable? But yeah, possibly. I don't even know. He he doesn't quite know either. He just knows he saw a box at some point in his childhood, and it was a, a key, and my dad shut it when he walked in the door. Who knows what was in there? It haunts him, but I, I I don't know. And I guess to jump back to answer your question about us having lots of conversations, like we lived together, so we talked twenty four seven, and I really have to say, like the strength of our relationship was the only thing that got us through this because we really don't fight at all about much of anything like we talk through it if he doesn't agree or i don't agree we just say that and we move on and thank goodness we agreed on like 99 percent of everything as far as what to get rid of and what to keep and stuff like that without that it, it yeah, could have been yeah. 10 years down the road well you just hear these stories sometimes right of and maybe it happens in bigger families at least that's the ones that i've heard of right is four or five kids and the parents pass away and they don't leave a will and then you got people arguing about who gets what and some kids are wealthy and some kids are poor and you just it just becomes this mess of if of what do we do with everything and who gets what exactly I, since we've gone through this my brother has kind of talked to some other folks or his friends that have similar situation kind of happen to them or they just kind of their parents passed away I, i've seen families turn on each other for like five thousand dollars and i i can't even fathom that like if they really break apart your family over five grand like my brother and i we could have just destroyed each other we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars like i think that the amount of money is almost not relevant it's just the person you're dealing with and money does weird things to people in almost any respect so it, that's just a really a wild card yeah kevin i think there's some really interesting lessons here as you've described this story and this unraveling was there any debt involved that you had to deal with as well so my dad being a mini mr money mustache level of frugal if not worse there was uh, no debt he didn't believe in debt. He bought everything cash, and that was it. So it was really I had that. I luckily had that example, and he lived that example. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So looking back, if you had the conversation now, let's just say you know replaying everything, what would you have wished that conversation would have looked like, so that you knew what to do or where things were at or, or how to go about you know unraveling everything? I agree. I think that. If anything, if he could have just written down like on a one sheet of paper, these are the five accounts to call. These are the three banks I deal with. Here's where the gold balloons are buried or, you know, whatever, like something super simple and short. Just here's where to go look. There's no other hidden treasures anywhere. Don't waste your time. Here's the, the map, if you will. Just keep it simple, stupid is like my favorite life motto. Just a simple one pager would have been more than enough. Yeah. Now, and I, he was probably, sorry, just, he was probably so young, right? Because if, if you were, you said around 30, right? So he was in his yeah. mid 50s, late 50s? He, he was about to turn 63. Okay, young 60. I mean, it's still. It's remarkable. Yeah, he was in good shape and like went hunting, horseback riding, you know, the whole nine yards. Like we figured at least 20 more years. That gets not, not so much. Yeah, totally. Now, I want to shift gears here a little bit and maybe just talk about, you know, the legacy that he's left. I know we've, we've concentrated on some of the things that maybe could have gone better or the, or the issues that, you know, took place in terms of you all trying to, to unravel this. But, you know, remarkably so, your, your father created this estate and, you know, he left you all with, with a, you know, a great sum of, of money, his heirs, to continue on his legacy. How is your father able to accumulate, you know, th this level of wealth? 
and to get to where he was, you know, at, at 63 before he passed? Well, I mean, being a doctor, he had a probably higher than average income, but at the most brute level, he just didn't waste money on stuff. Like we cooked food at home as a kid. We went out to dinner, like on our birthday, that we didn't have a lot of the, the trappings of everybody else. I guess it kind of, I think I wrote in my little notes, the dryer story. I think it might make a few people laugh. Like to the level of his frugality was the, the clothes dryer. He would duct the pipe into the house. He would take my mom's old pantyhose that had a run, attach it to the end. So when we'd run the dryer, it would heat the house. Then the lint that he would collect, he'd get the flat egg carton pallets, stuff the lint in there, and then he'd melt wax on it. And then he'd have these little egg-shaped nuggets of uh, lint. And then they were like beautiful little fire starters because they would light and burn slowly and light the fireplace to heat the house. So you would do that <laughs> sort of thing constantly. I like that. Or, we had solar water heater. If the shower ran out of hot water, you were going to have a cold shower. Like this is just how we lived. And I learned from that. So everything that I've received and my brother, we, I don't view it as mine. So I, the uh, first thing I did was go and set up a trust of my own, um, and set all the, then funded the trust is the most important thing. Like titled my current house into it, titled my uh, Vanguard accounts to it, and also a life insurance policy I have going to that as well. And then I have a life insurance policy going to my current wife to make sure she's taken care of, plus she gets my 401k and whatnot. But I want to pass everything on as, as much as I can. Like I, I live a great life and I, with the salary I earn, so I don't necessarily need to touch any of it. And I try not to. I just want to push it down the road, like skip a generation if I can in any, just try to do that. Yeah, totally. That was going to be my next question was, was what you've done now. But maybe I'll ask, has your brother, has this impacted him in a similar manner? Has he done some of the same things that you have? Or is he kind of gone a different route? <laughs> he has gone a slightly different route, more of the enjoying what was given to him route. Uh, but he doesn't have a family or a wife or anything like that to take care of. So he's just kind of frugally living and enjoying what he has. So I don't exactly know his plans for the future, but I keep guiding him directions and trying to get him to make it last at least as long as he can, if nothing else. Yeah, totally. Well, <laughs> it, it, when you say he's enjoyed it, is it, I mean, is he take vacations, bought toys, bought houses? What what's what? What do you mean, kind of in that context? Just for our listeners to know, you know, I think <laughs> we've got two drastic realities of what happens, right? I mean, this is this is typical America world. When something like this takes place, we've got two big decision makers in this house and one one does one thing and the other does the other, right? Oh, yeah. It couldn't be any more true. Like, I'm the hard-charging professional at work that does work. He's just kind of taking it easy and taking it slow and living his life without having to go to work all the time. <laughs> so, it's definitely at two ends of the spectrum as far as that goes. <laughs> Hopefully, that answers what you're trying to ask. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's interesting just you know, the, the two dynamics, right? And I think, you know, as, as we move into, you know, the next 20 and 30 years, the baby boomer generation, obviously, you know, sadly, who's been a, the richest generation in America and, you know, continuing to, to leave inheritances, there's going to be the biggest generational wealth transfer ever in the history of this country. And so we're, we're basically just on the heels of all that taking place. So I think there's going to be a lot more people in, in your situation, your brother's situation, where they're going to inherit a large sum of money, whether they're in their 30s or 40s or maybe even 50s, it's going to happen. Absolutely. So Kevin, getting back to you and, and what you want to do now going forward, you mentioned that, that you've got this this grand plan to, to maybe have this skip a generation and whatnot. Do you have a target, in, you know, passive income goal or net worth goal that, that you want to get to? I don't have a goal specifically of what I w want to get to. Uh, I do prefer dividend style investing. So I think if I could cover it, or maybe 40000 a year in dividends being paid, I think I could probably tone back on work a lot more or just have my wife stay home. I think she would enjoy that, but she is... A She's in the medical field as well, uh, so she wants to help women give birth to babies. So if I can help her realize that dream, I think that would be pretty noble and make her happy. And happy wife equals happy life as well, I keep hearing. Yeah, totally. Do you have plans to retire early at all? So in 2013, when I was sitting on the money for a year and reading pretty much the entire internet of finance, I 
got into that community. I discovered Mr. Money Mustache and all the other guys. And I had those lofty goals at first. And I found, eventually ran across a retirement calculator called Prelana. If anybody, I don't, it's a free version that I've used. They have a nicer one, but you, you can plug in like inflation, nominal returns, re returns. Uh, you can inflation adjust your expenses. You can put in your funding sources. Like it's pretty in depth. So I was able to play around with that and come to a number where I could almost do it. But then I kind of realized like, I don't want to retire because what am I going to do? Like I'm a v- I'm extremely active person. Like I need shiny objects or I'm, I would just go mad and gnaw my arm off. It's nice being independent, but I don't have any natural plans to retire early, I would say. Yeah, I, I want to follow up with what you just said about how you took a year off and something you mentioned to us before when we were chatting before the show, that you, you got the money right and then you waited a year to do anything with it as you were learning. And, and I just thought that was really good advice. Is that someone? Is that something you just learned on your own? Did someone give you that advice to do that or... It was a year, right, before you decided to do anything with the money that you received? Yeah. Uh, so I wish I could take credit for the advice. I had heard it somewhere. I don't know exactly where, but it was along the lines of don't make any rash or sudden changes once you inherit or get a large sum of money, period. Like, I think it was a uh, reading a, a bankrupt uh, lottery winner's article of some kind somewhere. So I figured... I'll just learn. <laughs> there uh, you go. I think yeah. I've, read, I've read some of those, right? Yeah. But, so yeah. in 2013, I would, the check started rolling in and I was like, I'm just going to sit and I'm going to read the entire Boggleheads forum. Or, and then I consumed all of that. And then I read some of the other ones. And then I read the uh, Random Walk Down Wall Street. And then I started formulating what felt right for me. And eventually I opened a Scott Trade account, closed that. And then bought, uh, not bought, uh, open Vanguard and I've been there ever since. Just kind of hanging out in ETFs because it's simple. I don't have to think about it. And I try to consolidate everything into one place for just keep it simple, stupid. And, and you mentioned you set up a trust and you want this money to last, right? You don't view it as your own. Do you keep it in separate accounts? Do you keep it segregated? Are you, are you less risky on your investments with it? Or, or you just say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to invest it the same way as I would invest my normal portfolio. So. The trust is set up. The trust has its own checking and savings account, and the trust owns the taxable account of Vanguard in its entirety. I control it, and I can do anything to it I want, take money out, etc., but it's all owned by the trust. Regarding how I invest it, I, I'm a fairly aggressive. I don't own any bonds whatsoever. I tend to find them correlated in some regard, so it's like, why not just put the pedal to the metal and let it go? Because if, if I truly don't need this or use this money and it's for my son or other future kids, they have a runway of like 50, 60 years. Like if I just let it grow to the max at that period of time, it seems like the best way that I could pass on. And maybe I'll write into the trust that X percentage of it skips them and goes to their children. So it skips another generation of something. I mean, these are all grand plans, but it seems like a worthwhile. Do, do people know you're a millionaire? I learned early on to keep my mouth shut. I don't, having assets changes your outlook. I won't lie in any regard about that. But you, when you're speaking to, like, it changes your outlook and the way you view things. Like, I'm not concerned about a $400 bill. It's not something, and, or I could write a check for five grand and still not really be concerned about it. I always try to focus, like, is this going to improve my life or not? But it just changes your outlook to the point. I guess the better way to say it is the problems that I face. I can't speak to anybody about because they can't relate to it. And then I just come off sounding like a complete jerk. Like, of of course, how hard is it to do something with a hundred thousand when the person you're trying to speak to is struggling with a hundred dollar bill? Like the scale changes so much. And it just, I just learned to not just to live my life as frugally and as generously as I can and help people if they ask for it. But otherwise just keep my mouth closed. How did you learn it? How did you learn it, Kevin? Was it a few awkward conversations or there was something a, specific? Not really a specific instance. Um, I've always been fairly quiet and private in the first place. And my mom, uh, I would say culturally, was always taught and told me just there's no reason to go blabbing. Like there's no point in blabbing that you have something that somebody don't. It doesn't because that's just mean. It doesn't solve any problems or doesn't win you any friends. So I was just always there's no need to tell anybody, hey, I can go buy a Tesla. Like, why? Like, I won't and I wouldn't, 
but I don't see a need to go flaunt. I'm a very modest person, I think is a good way to say it. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. I appreciate it. So, I mean, we we should note here, and I think we did at the beginning that you were well on your way, right? At the end of your twenties, you had a couple hundred thousand dollars in net worth. You seemed like a frugal guy even before all this happened, right? Yeah. I was already trying to max my 401k and keep going on, but eventually I would have gotten there, just not two years later. Yeah, yeah, right. And, and, but I mean, your parents taught you that, right? Or you learned it on your own, however it happened. I mean, you probably got some of the frugality from your father, but I'd say I blame parents for everything or thank them <laughs> for everything. Good or bad, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so is there anything going back in your life? I don't just mean the situation with your father. Or, what advice would you give? Is there something, you know, that you wish you would have done earlier in your twenties and your mid twenties before your dad passed or, or, or when he passed or after? What, what advice would you give to somebody who's in their twenties is maybe one part of this. And then the second part would be somebody who did receive an inheritance and maybe has to go through the same thing. Is there anything we haven't touched on that you would recommend? Well, I would just say in the early 20s, everybody struggles and everybody sees this giant mountain in front of them. So it's maybe more spiritual than like money actions. Like if you move a pebble every single day and you put it in front of that mountain, eventually you're going to be able to climb over it. Just like compounding takes slow and takes time. Like if you save a dollar for two dollars at every check, eventually it's going to amount to something. So don't psych yourself out or definitely do not pay attention to anything you see on social media because those people are all broke. In my my opinion, I should say, yeah, <laughs> just, just stick to your plan. I have a friend that says, uh, since you know these Corona, we're recording this July twenty first, just for our listeners. But since this coronavirus stuff and the stimulus payments come, he he said, look, what I've realized is everybody makes less than you think they do, and nobody has any money saved. Like that's th- those that are the so two true. things that, that he's like, you know what? This is what I kind of realized because the stimulus payments have become the the big revealer, right? Of of how much people are making. <laughs> exactly, and if they're if they're foolish enough to post how big their stimulus is, it's not hard to go back math and figure out what the tax return said either. So oh. and I, so yeah, so always just quiet and don't say anything. <laughs> Seems like the easiest way to go. So let's do some rapid fire questions with you, Kevin, in short on time. So what's been the most expensive car you've ever purchased? Uh, probably late twenties. I bought like an F250 diesel because that was the cool thing to do. And it was probably like 38, 37,000, somewhere around there. Okay. What about the most expensive meal out that you personally paid for? So I've always been pretty generous. So I, I would always treat tables of people that I was with to stuff. So easily a few hundred bucks, dozens of times. Maybe that might be a little foolish, but I I think it's fun. I, I like to take pleasure in other people smiling. I guess. Yeah, I mean, a good follow up because of because of the wealth at a young age, right? Regardless of how it happened, do you find yourself to be more generous and more charitable? At least either giving away money or, or you know taking people out to dinner or whatever it is. I would say absolutely yes. Um, I've always been generous, and I think most people are at heart generous. It's just easier to give a little bit extra when you know you don't need that. Twenty dollars. So I would say I've definitely stepped up giving in general. Yes. Well, what's worth the money? What's worth spending more money on for you? Ah, uh, just smiles. Like it's making yourself happy or making somebody else happy that's close to you. Like it seems kind of generic, but it it fits with my style, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever used a financial advisor? Yes. I know these are rapid fire. I could go off on more stories, but I currently do not. I disagreed with a lot of the advice that I was given and adding up what they were doing, following with the, the transactions, it, the, the fees were just uh, uh, out of this world. With, so I was really kind of burned by that. So I don't do anything anymore. It's all Vanguard self-directed. Yeah. it's. I mean, it's interesting. I appreciate you saying it because Jace, I think we've noticed a pattern here, right? I mean, most people, most millionaires that we've interviewed said no. And of those that say yes, they, they say at one point I did, but I don't anymore. Yep. So very few say yes to this question. To be fair, I think there's a lot of very hardworking men and women in the field. I think their just payment structure is a little bit biased, like as everybody also can figure out. Like they get paid to sell and trade. So then that's obviously the opposite of what I want them to do. Right. I mean, you could have a fee only, right, that that charges the set amount, but. And, and I think there's valuable things, right? I think for certain people that maybe don't want to deal with it, right? It's, it's nice to have somebody look over it, right? I think Absol- that can be, yeah. I think that can be super valuable to somebody that's not involved as much or doesn't want to be, you know, and that's not a bad thing. 100% so, correct. 
what's your household spending, annual household spending? I would say, including mortgage and all the other stuff, five fifty five hundred a month, probably a pretty good number. Okay, Maybe six thousand a month. Yeah, so yeah if, about sixty five seventy a year. Yeah, gives my family a nice, comfortable life. Uh, as much as you're comfortable sharing, what's been the range of household income through your working life? <laughs> so, so at my first job, I was making eight bucks an hour. And today it's about 60. So it's from, I don't know what $8 an hour is a year, but uh, 60 is about 120. Okay, good for you. So just last question here in closing, what does it mean to be happy and fulfilled? I think you mentioned smiles, right? But <laughs> has, has the money brought that? I mean, obviously it happened a little bit with a trade-off. It definitely brought security. Um, I was always... I mean, the lady, my coworker said this today is like, I exude positive feelings to people around me. So I think I was already that way. It's just a lot. It comes out more because I don't have anything sitting on my shoulders anymore. So, right. so just, yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, Kevin, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. It's not an easy conversation to have. So, so thanks for writing in. Thanks for being willing to share. I think I've learned personally. I think our listeners has, Jace probably has as well. So really well, appreciate thanks. it. Thank you. And everyone, that's Kevin net worth of of 1.4 million. Thanks again. You're welcome. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast with Clark Sheffield and Chase Mantinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website at millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.